I just continue in the state of openness. Today we're looking at the marriage of the head and heart, the intellect and the intuition. How these work together. And so often it is the intellect that is in charge. It is observing and describing its reality. The intuition is often quiet, silenced by the noise of the intellect. which is why I spend moments becoming still. To still this fact gathering faculty. Just for a few moments. So the intuitive side may tell its story. It tells a story of peace. A story of fearlessness. A story of quiet power. As I let go, I feel the embrace of those everlasting arms of spirit. The warm breath of the Almighty.
for a few moments of quiet. I relax in this peace. I begin now to come from this time of quiet. The pure light of God opens my mind and heart to a deeper reality. Thank you, God. Amen. Okay, so today we're looking at the marriage of head and heart. And one of the reasons I picked this theme or this uh, topic is because this week Beth and I celebrated our anniversary again. It was our 43rd. And I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around that one because I'm about 42, I think. Yeah. So I don't know how that works. <laughs> Very interesting and hard to imagine. But uh, we got married, I think we were 22. Well, you can do the math. It's, uh, I think it's 22, we were 22. We got married in a Baptist church and we were attending unity. We actually had a unity minister do the, do the ceremony. It was a friend of Beth's. She worked at Silent Unity and uh, drove I guess it was 60 miles twice you know to, to the church to do the wedding and the rehearsal and all that stuff we had a pretty big wedding Beth I wanted to elope and Beth wanted a regular wedding so we had the regular wedding and it was good I'm glad we did it there were quite a few people there but the uh, Baptist church the minister was uh, not too sure about having a unity minister come in and and do the wedding, so they had to have a board meeting, I understand, and to make sure that was okay. I've actually been denied uh, doing weddings in churches because I'm a unity minister. And our theolo we are theolog theologically impure, according to the uh, one organization that wouldn't let me do a wedding. So I've been discriminated against. I know what that feels like. And actually, I was thankful because I didn't really want to do the wedding <laughs> that day. I had other things I'd rather do, so it worked out all right. But anyway, the whole religious business is uh, pretty interesting. But the um, so I've been thinking about weddings. I've been thinking about our wedding, our marriage, and the 43 years that we've spent. Also, another milestone that I didn't mention because I wasn't here. None of us were was our 17th anniversary here in Grand Junction. Uh, we had that on the 3rd of June. And that doesn't seem possible. And I just think of all the changes we've been through and everything that uh, we've seen here, just, you know, the more you think about it, the more you can kind of get a, a grasp on the time element. But uh, where does it all go? You know, that's, that's the thing we, well, hi, babe, I didn't see you there. <laughs> 
Did you ride your bike, your trike? <laughs> uh, that's one thing we've all done on this uh, outing. Beth and I got a couple of trikes, uh, big wheels. You know, <laughs> no, they're they're like a 24 speed uh, trike with the two wheels in the front and one in the back, and they're a lot of fun. And then Bev turns around and gets one too, and so we're going to go out riding one of these days. But um, what was I talking about? <laughs> Anniversary. Oh, yeah, we've been here 17 years, so all the, where does all that time go? It's just incredible. But that kind of brings us to the, the idea that the physical is it's here, and we're paying attention to it. You know, we pay a lot of attention to it, but it just slips by. You know, it just goes on. It's not what we are. And we can all say, you know, you look back on your life and you can always say, I was there. You know, I was there when that, at that wedding. I was there when all this happened. So who's that? Who was there? You look in the mirror and there's not one, one hair on your head, if you have any left, that was there. Not one cell in your body. That's, that's pretty, I've always thought that was interesting. So what is the, the part of me that's looking there saying, I was there? You can't see that part in the mirror, but you see with that part. And you look at the body and you say, where'd that come from? But you never left. You know, you, you and I have never left this whole experience. We're like a point of consciousness that's in this ever-moving sea of materiality. And we so often identify with that part of us, and, and you have to, you know, to, to maintain it and just keep it going and keep going in a, in a way that's, uh, that's enjoyable, as enjoyable as you can make it. I love having a body, and I love being able to use it in ways, um, as I've told you, I've kind of brought back my interest in photography lately, and I'm out almost every morning at sunup photographing birds. Uh, or whatever happens to move uh, other than people and it's uh it's something i've always wanted to pursue and it's uh you know you have to have a body and the bird has to have a body and you've got to have a physical dimension to make that work i can imagine without a body it's also pretty cool you can do all kinds of things you know uh, from what people describe it's pretty incredible but while I've got one, I want to use it in, in a way that is meaningful to me, and I know all of you do too. But it's, it's important to keep that balance that I'm not this body, and it's, uh, uh, but I was, I've always been there. I've always been here looking out through these eyes and observing the world around me. So what is that? That's, that's what we are, the spiritual being that's having this human experience. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today in the sense that uh, Jesus is uh, quoted as saying this, but I don't think he said it because it's, it's uh, Paul says it almost verbatim. And Paul's writings actually came before uh, any of the Gospels. Paul started writing about 53 AD and the earliest Gospel was Mark, which appeared about 65 AD. So Paul started writing much earlier, but he quoted this. Uh, so I, what I think it is, or what scholars think it is, is a, a saying that just was kind of common um, that circulated around and people would use it you know, to, to prove a point. Jesus was emphasizing the point of uh, you don't get divorced. You know, it was anti-divorce statement. That's how, how uh, Matthew used it, had Jesus using it. But I didn't, I'm not including that part. He says, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's used in a lot of weddings. I don't use it myself. I've had over a thousand weddings, and I have never used that particular one unless somebody asked me to use it. But the, uh, the idea is... Uh, you know, just on a surface level, it, that's what happens, basically. 
but we're not interested so much on the surface level because there's not so much to learn from that. If we look at it metaphysically, what is the spiritual message here? How can we interpret this? And I'm not saying this is what the writer meant or the early sayers of the saying meant, but anytime you have a comparison or a, uh, a scripture that talks about male and female, metaphysically, from a spiritual point of view, you can interpret that as both the thinking and feeling nature, not of two different people, but of each individual. We all have a masculine, feminine side. The masculine side is the intellectual side. The feminine side is the intuitive side. And the masculine side has been the one that's been dominant, which may be why that's all occurred in our society overall. I don't know. But um, what we are looking for is a balance of intuition and intellect. What we're seeing uh, basically in our society is uh, the strengthening of the intellect through science. You know, it's all facts. It's what we can see. It's what we can hear. It's what we, uh, the facts we can see on the table. We're being governed by that. And uh, Einstein was a, was, a, was a great intuitive, actually. But a lot of modern scientists deny that, say he didn't mean that the intuition was important. He didn't mean what he said, in other words, about the intuition. But I think he did. I think he was extremely intuitive. Uh, I understand, I'm not an Einstein, but haven't you ever worked on a problem intellectually? You tried to figure it, out, figure it all out for a long time, and then pretty soon, suddenly you know, you know what to do, the answer comes to you and often when you're not thinking about it. Or if you're looking for something, something you've lost, you know, that pencil you had five minutes ago, you're looking for it all, all over the place, and you stop and despair, and you give up, and you scratch your head, and you find out you stuck it behind your ear. I've done that a number of times. So the intuitive side is, is more receptive to the bigger picture. And we often think of it in terms of solving problems, but on the spiritual level, we don't want to think of it that way. We want to think of it as gaining spiritual context. As I said in the meditation, you know, there's a, there's a part of us that lives on the land, but there's also this ocean. And we're most familiar with the land, the intellectual side, the things we can see and touch and, and all. But our being actually rises from the ocean, from the cosmic ocean, from the uh, spiritual ocean. And our attention is not there very much. But we have the faculty to tap into it, and that is the intuitive faculty. So what this, the way I read this is, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female, intellectual and intuitive? We are created as intellectual and intuitive beings. So for a man to leave his father and mother, that's the, uh, the symbolism there is leaving the self-image. And that is not to totally give it up, <clears throat> but to recognize that I'm not the product of my parents. There's something more, you know, my parents gave birth to my body. That's pretty, pretty evident, pretty clear. Where did my soul come from? Did they give birth to my soul? And again, modern science says, yes, they did. That your soul is uh, basically a chemical reaction, neurological. But I don't think that's true. Science says that because it's something that can be observed. It's intellectual. And if you're totally grounded in the intellect, then nothing can come out of what can't be observed. But from the spiritual point of view, did our parents give birth to our soul? And the answer to me is absolutely no. They did not. And I think that's... Um, it's a pretty freeing thought when you think about it. You know, I stepped into this arena, had these parents, they were the door. 
that I came through. But I'm not that physical body. And I'm not the history of that physical body. A lot of people get locked into their history. Maybe they did something along the road someplace and maybe they're not so proud of it. But they forever identify with it. I did this, you know, I'm, that's me. That's part of my history. But is it part of the history of your soul? You know, that's the, the larger context and I think the one that helps set us free from things like that. That if you just identify with your physical history, that's your father and mother. So when you say that we are to leave our father and mother, the man leaves his father and mother, that's the intellect pulls away from that identity, doesn't deny it, it pulls away from it. You know, when you get married, you don't lose your father and mother necessarily. But you pull away from that and you start a new life. You start a new, it's a new beginning. So to leave your, your father and mother is the, it's the symbolism here is the intellect pulling away from the historical identity, the body-based self-image. Simply saying, that's not all that I am. Because we join our wife the intuition opens up and we begin to see that we're something more than the physical side. And it's a very important revelation to have. It's not one that, you know, I could not probably give this talk, well, I, I probably could in a traditional church, but it would take quite a bit of explanation, maybe a series type of thing. I know you guys get it right off. But when you have a spiritual awakening, and probably almost every one of you in this room came from another background, a religious background of some kind, and you were going down that road, maybe you started getting a little bit uncomfortable with it, not, maybe you didn't have all the answers you needed, maybe you had a crisis in your life, and that religion couldn't answer it, that it didn't provide for you the answers you were looking for. And in one sense, that's what it means to leave your father and mother. It's the intellect saying, well, maybe there's something more. And so you open your mind and maybe you run across a daily word or something and you find your wife. You know, that begins to open your intuitive sign. It made no sense for me to pursue unity in the environment that I grew up in. I didn't know a single person that was interested in it. There was no reason I should have found this and pursued it. There was no influence around me saying, take a look at this. Maybe there's an alternative to that Baptist church. Something to me would have, was looking for that, I guess. And so when I found the book Lessons in Truth, it's like I met my wife. That is, the intuition opened up. Here's another way to look at this whole thing. So if we don't take this literally, we can get a lot more miles out of it and understand our own story. You can probably look at your own life, your own path, and maybe you don't remember exactly when you began changing or opening your mind to this kind of thinking, but there was a moment when that happened probably a gradual, there was a period, let's just put it that way, where that happened. And maybe a highlight, maybe a, an experience, a, a day when like me, you walk into this public library and you find a book on a shelf that you'll always remember. That was a turning point. But what's interesting, and I've thought about, thought about this a lot, is I could only respond to something like that if it was already alive in me. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, you take that book, you hand it to somebody that's never even thought about it, it will make no sense to them. They have not yet left their father and mother. And the funny thing is, the majority of people will never leave their father and mother. 
they may abandon the religion that they're in, but they will still use that as the measuring stick. If they reject God, they reject, they're rejecting what they've been exposed to, not an exploration of God, not some new idea that's been presented to them. They're not rejecting that. They're rejecting what they were given at birth. And they're saying, I'm an atheist because I don't believe that. And if that's the only alternative, I'd be an atheist also. But there are many alternatives, and there are many ways to look at it, but you have to leave your mother and father. You can be an atheist and still be living with your mother and father. You're just saying, I don't believe what they're saying. I don't believe what they believe in. But I don't have an alternative. I'm just chucking the whole thing. And I've sense that that is what happens with a lot of people who declare themselves atheists. They're rejecting a point of view, not a reality we call God, that maybe if they listen to some other point of view, and maybe they're too angry to listen, or maybe they just think the whole thing is not even worth looking at. But they're still married to their past. They're still married to that mother and father, that self-image from which that was born, but they may not associate with it at all, and that happens a lot too. So I like to think of this verse as a reference to the ideal marriage between the intellectual, the male, and the intu intuition, the female, of each individual. We have a physical and spiritual side, with the body being the earthly vehicle of the soul. The fact-oriented intellect is such an invaluable tool for navigating through the material world that we often neglect the intuitive spiritual side. And that's, uh, again, you can be involved in a religion and still be totally intuitively asleep. That doesn't make a lot of sense to people. What some people are calling an awakened intuition is emotion. It's emotionalism. And there's a great deal of our country that is run on emotionalism. Uh, our whole advertising industry depends on emotionalism. If they can sell a product based on making you feel like you'd be better if you had that, then they'll sell the product whether, it's, whether it works or not. If you believe that it works, if you believe that toothpaste will really make your teeth whiter or that deodorant will make you have more friends or whatever, whatever they're trying to sell. Look at any advertisement and say, okay, they're selling this product, but what are they really selling? They're trying to get you emotionally involved in something and get you to see yourself doing that thing, get you to see yourself as more successful if you have that thing we see it in every department of life, and you really see it in religion. You know, when you see these huge crowds and everybody's got their hand up praising the Lord and all this stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, emotionalism. And I don't want to pretend like I understand what's going on in everybody's mind and heart when it comes to something like this. But you know, a lot of people are living a life as a wretch. That's why Amazing Grace, the song, is so popular with the original words. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So if you're a wretch and you feel you were saved, that's an emotional boost. And that's what draws a lot of people is, I'm not worth it, but somebody thought I was. So that's great, you know, and that's, I'm part of a community that thinks I'm okay. That's not a spiritual awakening. I don't care how you cut it, it's not a spiritual awakening. They would not understand what I'm saying right now. The spiritual awakening is when you have some level of experience that you are, your reality, that which you are. Forget Jesus, you know, forget all the religious stuff, and I know... <laughs> Sounds horrible. Forget all that stuff. It has nothing to do with your spirituality. 
with what you are at the deepest level. And when your intuition, intuitive portal, as I like to call it, opens up and your spiritual nature becomes in your mind a reality, you know that's what you are. You may not always stay in that state of mind, but it will change you forever. You will never be able to step off that path once you have that revelation. You'll never be able to go back. You may have a lot of doubts. But it's like Jesus uh, lost a bunch of his followers when he talked about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, all that stuff that grossed them all out, and they all left. And of course he wasn't talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He was talking about, if you embrace what I'm saying at the soul level, the life blood, spiritual essence, the substance of spirit, the body, the flesh, when you take that into your consciousness, it becomes part of your consciousness. He turned to his remaining disciples and said, will you guys also go? And they said, where can we go? They went far enough down the path where they had no choice but to stay on that path. Maybe that really upset them. Maybe that moment upset them that they didn't leave. So we have those moments. Because this spiritual thing seems very small a lot of times. When especially we get into a deal like we're in right now. People are saying they're praying, but they're, they're saying, God up in the sky, come down and get rid of this plague, or come down and change these people, or come down and do something. There isn't an organic awakening, an awareness. The ones that are having that level, you don't hear of. You don't hear from them. All we're seeing is the intellects screaming their perspective and the emotionalists screaming theirs. And that's what we see on the news. Metaphysically speaking, the man leaving his father and mother represents that period when we expand our awareness into something more than we typically associate with our body-based self-image, our earthly history. And that's very important. To be joined with a wife is to become aware intuitively that our true essence is spiritual, that we occupy a body, but we are much more. And again, this is the value of meditation the reason we say relax your body get into a position where you won't be disturbed you shut all the the noise off and you go alone and what's the first thing that happens you close your eyes and this brain of yours <laughs> that never stops that's the self image causing the disturbance and it takes practice it takes discipline to say that's not me that's not what I'm looking for because it's there telling you all these things you've got to solve all these people you got to contact the text you got to send or the whatever you know it seems important to the body and all this stuff goes on and chatters as Carlos Castanedos call it the internal dialogue it's going on all the time so we relax the body we're not pretending, not denying the body. We're relaxing the body, putting ourselves in a comfortable position. People say, should I sit cross-legged on the floor in a lotus position? Should I, you know, lie on the bed? You shouldn't do something where you go to sleep, and you shouldn't do something that will so cramp your legs that you can't get up. <laughs> sit in a natural position. But the whole idea is let the body go for a time. Get in a position where you can forget the body for a time. And then you bring the mind into this, all this chatter going on. I release this. I let this go. I relax the body. And you feel this relaxation. It gradually move deeper and deeper into this state. And the mind naturally slows down. And it gets to a point, and then it stops, and it starts thinking of things again, and starts creeping back up. Well, get up and go about your business. Don't try to force it. But practice this. Do this until you make that breakthrough where you suddenly are okay 
as a spiritual being. You've joined with your wife at that moment. The intellect has said, okay, I'll step back. It's all right. I don't have to solve all these problems. Let's listen to the intuition. Let's listen to Mary. You know what Mary has to say. Mary's pregnant, by the way. Where'd that come from? There's a potential here that we haven't seen up to this point. The marriage of head and heart is the beginning of a new understanding of how we approach life. And again, we're so immersed in the physical, the history, all the stuff that, we're, that we are on that level, you don't just chuck it. You know, you just don't walk away from it. It's a, it's a gradual thing and you, you think different ways at different times, things occur to you in different ways. Like if you're angry at somebody. You could ask yourself, is this me? Or is this my body history? And that's, you know, you start asking yourself questions. And if you say it's not me, so how do I feel? Is this person so powerful that they have the ability to make me angry? To ruin my day? Or as an eternal spiritual being, am I larger than that? And we can kind of work through stuff like that to just realize that we're not that reactionary that we think we are. Am I a human being seeking a spiritual experience or am I a spiritual being having a human experience? This thought alone is mind expanding in this sense, we leave our earthly mother and father as our beginning point. They gave birth to our body, but not to our soul, so we turn to the soul, which has always carried the larger picture of what our life is about. So it's just kind of some food for thought. Whatever you're going through in your life, just make this comparison. Have I left my father and mother and joined my wife? Or am I still attached to them? Am I still sitting here quivering in fear about something or anger about something or affirming that some restrictive whatever is controlling my life? Or do I lift up my eyes and see something broader? That's always the question in front of us. All right. Thank you for coming out and... I will be here next week, and I hope you are too. Watching a talk presented by Reverend Doug Bottorf at Independent Unity here in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado. We would like to thank everyone who joined us here today, as well as those of you who joined us online. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, and be sure to share it with those you think who might benefit from this message. If this brought value to your life, please consider donating to us on PayPal. Thanks again for watching.